Olaf, for, thank you so much for joining us for the studio visit. That's really very special in, this, in these times. It's very, very exciting indeed. Where are you at the moment, Olaf? For? I'm in my Copenhagen studio. Yeah. And, um, I am, um, I've had a studio here for many years. It's a lovely old villa who used to be the studio of a painter who actually designed this particular villa. Yeah. Is your uh, is symbol, symbolistic painter called Willemsen, in case you know. Yeah. Are you in a, are you, do you have a big computer in front of you or you have a small computer that you could show us a little bit where you are? I can indeed, it's a laptop. Let me just see, see if I turn my computer, you can see wow. that this is how it looks and it has a wonderful window to the north. Beautiful. And then it has a, it has a, another window to the south. Uh, the window is um, uh, sort of sharing its uh, its wall with the peacocks there. That is a uh, that's not a living peacock, just so yeah. it's not like you, Klaus, who has a who has a is that true a goose? Yeah. Uh, I should maybe contemplate to have a real peacock inspired by you. But but the interesting thing is the one window to the south for warm light and one window a big window to the north for cold light. So I can sort of. I can do my light experiments in here. And you just came from Berlin. Were you basically in, in lockdown in Berlin? Olaf, or did yes. you still move and travel? What was your couple of last weeks like? Actually, at the studio, um, we were very early uh, sort of self-locking us uh, down as I had a lot of things going on. So. Um, we already late February um, sort of divided the studio into uh, several groups, uh, had a lot of people going to home office and also received the wonderful grant from the German government that I as an artist could receive. So that gave me enough funds to make sure that I did not have to let, let anyone go. Uh, and I have had the pleasure of working in the studio for now nine, nine weeks, um, uh, you know, without having to stop. And I have, I think 30 people or so who are still working in small teams. And the funny thing is they don't meet. Uh, I mean, in four teams, uh, they don't meet the other teams. So we, we've been quite disciplined as I, as I am open. I was opening a show in, in March in Tokyo. I have a show at the Guggenheim Bilbao, the one that was at Tate. I, had a show, I have a show at Kunsthaus Zurich, which is ending now, actually. Uh, I have a show in Porto, the Seralves Foundation. And it has been quite, um, well, it's been quite quite special to have all these shows. I don't normally have so many shows. It just so happened. And they are all closed. It's incredible. Um, so I've been, And I have a show in Brisbane. Uh, it's just one work, but a very large one in, in, in Brisbane at the wonderful museum there. And, uh, so so um, it's, it's been a very special time. It's not been only challenging. It's been also wonderful, but... All in all, it is, uh, it's been unbelievable. And have you been able to produce or to be productive or was it more time to pause and to reset and to reflect? I have had some uh, long-term sort of more commission-based works, which I don't have to finish. You know, they, they span over one, two, three, four years and, and those have to, had to go on. So, a part of my studio had could still be working. I also was lucky to have some activity in the in the otherwise uh, crippled uh, art market, uh, but a little bit it was not completely um, sort of suddenly disappeared. So my gallerist, uh, I have to credit them for working like extra extra hard to keep a little bit of a livelihood uh, available. And and in that sense, um, it was a slowdown, and I was able to. Um, experiment and pay attention to things that are otherwise quite rare. I call it to look down, like down to earth, you could say, right? And this notion of, 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 of sort of being present. And I don't recall when did I not travel for nine weeks. It was like so sad to say it, but I do not recall when I did that. So I, um, maybe a little bit out of uh, being desperate, I started activating my relationship with digital work. And we might talk a little bit about that later, but well, that actually turned out to be um, good fun. But I must admit, I miss 
having a hug and a body. You know, I mean, seeing people in 3D. Yeah. <laughs> so, I so, uh, so, so I can't complain. There are people who have been really struggling a lot more than I have. I've been, I've been lucky. My team has been amazing. And uh, as I said, I just have to say the German government supporting the cultural sector has created a, a lot of safe, you know, safe um, opportunities for young artists to continue to work. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remind myself every morning what I'm grateful for in a way. That's a way because you could think, oh, it's Groundhog Day. Which day is it? Tuesday, Wednesday, Sunday, Monday? Don't know. You can also start at turning it around and just like start by being grateful that we are still here and that we are in a situation where we can talk and we have conversations with each other and exchange. So it's actually wonderful. Mm -hmm. You were one of the very first artists I, artist, I asked for a studio visit and you said, oh, we do it immediately. But you are so busy. It was March when I asked you and you gave me May 23rd, which at the time felt like, oh, we're not going to be in lockdown anymore because I think I asked you around March 20th. So it was more than two months, but that's how, how of course your brain and your schedule and everything went. And then last week, because it was so long, last week I said, Olaf, we have to work on the presentation. And normally we receive from the artist studio presentation, but we know each other for nearly 30 years and you gave me the task to make the presentation. So you will be surprised by the selection. Okay, well, I'm both sorry and happy. <laughs> <laughs> so you will be surprised by the selection. So we could actually okay. start our slideshow. Mm -hmm. That's always we have to hear. I'm starting the slideshow here of a studio visit because Joan Weinstein was on the call. Amanda Hunt was on the call. We had talked about Pacific Standard Time. We had talked about Tom Lerner was on the call. We have talked about what are the scientific challenges and what are the ecological challenges? And we had Haley Mellon uh, discussing these with us. So for us, uh, David Johnson, Brian Chess, all of these people we are talking ecology about and you are at the heart of this discussion. So this was us making a little bit after a long, long day of discussions, we had some fun. Mm -hmm. And I put three, three, three pictures here. We can go slowly through this, which is installing beauty to the next, which is this incredible sphere that you mm -hmm. moved into the studio to the next one. Because for me, it was, when you look for Olaf on social media, you don't find Olaf or you, you find studio Olaf Eliasson. And from the very beginning on, in the 90s, you always put emphasis that it's not you who is, is the only kind of mind creating. You very early on worked with an architect who had, relation, who had a relation to Buckminster Fuller. You found a vocabulary. You, you work not only with architects, with scientists. You work with cooks. You work with all different... different um, expertises and I, I would love for you to say a little bit about what it means for you to be studio Olaf Eliasson. Well thank you Klaus and thank you for this very generous introduction and the first picture we saw before was actually when I was looking silly there in the middle it was in fact a, a bulb collection uh, incandescent bulbs as we know now all the LED the fancy LED bulbs has taken over uh, so there's a lot of, uh, should I say, available incandescent bulbs, some of the very rare ones. Uh, and I've been collecting them um, here and there. And uh, so it's a little bit like, I wouldn't call it a cemetery, it was a little unfair. But, but you know, these are all the, the bulbs that has been put out of work. Uh, and it is, in fact, it's just a fascinating, uh, you know, uh, sort of collection of knowledge that has somehow passed now, right? So, so in that sense, the studio has this... Um, I believe relationship with a um, number of more explorative things here. This is, in fact, trying to make a, a beauty, and 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 here you can see people are actually working. That's nice to see. Um, a bit unfair also for me to say so, but but the studio has about a hundred and maybe twenty-five people or so, and the kitchen uh, is the sort of 
hard as it is the room in which where we where we where we discuss why instead of talking about how. And there's a number of teams. One, as you said, is architects. There's also sort of um, more like um, should I say exhibition uh, developers who works with me on exhibitions. There is a, actually a workshop for blacksmith, for carpenter, electricians, and um, kitchen. There's a R and D workshops where we are uh, trying to to sort of hold hands with the academia, and that's also where social science and uh, the homepage and, and uh, a bit of education and the archive is uh, is located and and the, the the ideal is of course that all of this works together uh, and of course on a good day it's 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 literally a miracle due to the great uh, effort of everyone on a bad day it is uh, highly silified uh, where everyone is more like into themselves as as one can imagine and and the the, the lucky thing is that i have been able to um, exercise a high degree of community and a shared sense of responsibility that's why i i always made the studio as transparent as possible also the, the studio to other students and and guests because i think it is very important to to normalize that an artist studio is not how should i say it you know it's not a sort of a a, a hungry semi-drunken artist up on some rooftop with a candle trying to do a sketch uh, and in that sense, um, I, I up until now uh, have had a quite open uh, policy about uh, you know not hiding what is going on. And and uh, just to f sort of end that note, that that I think it's you know to, to work in the studio is is a wonderful and 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 magic thing. And the the, the what is so special, I think, is that you know we we obviously start with a sketch. I would like to think that. I'm the one who comes with it or makes it and, and so on. But, but the idea is, you know, the fertilization of thinking, of course, comes out of everywhere. But the journey from the sketch to the artwork is one of many choices, models, experts, advice, economy, lots of lots of stuff. And what is, I think, important is the, the choices. Should it be blue or should it be red? It's not creative choices by definition it is the consequences of the choice that is creative. It's like what happens to the world when it is green and when it is blue. So, so somehow creativity or, or the potential of our lives in how it changes the world. Right? So, so the, 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 the studio has this quite sincere obsession of being interconnected or interwoven with the world around it. And that I think sort of, that is somehow my ambition. This is a recent work, in, in fact, I. Uh, it's in my native country, Iceland, being yeah. Icelandic, Danish, German uh, by now. You had a good photo, Klaus. <laughs> what, what for me was so interesting when we looked at the studio, for you, it was always important to include science, to always include the idea of experiment, and to always, because I remember when Madeleine Greenstein, Roxanne Makoc and I worked on your show, which is nearly like 15 years ago, that was in uh, San Francisco and in New York. Uh, we often said it's first about a wow, and then it's an aha, because there is an effect that, sound, that looks like un, undiscoverable and unex, unexplainable, but then you do see actually what you're doing. You're always a procedure in your work is always visible. And I felt that was so important when we talked recently, you mentioned, you quoted, you say, sometimes the river is a bridge. And I really remember you, you saying this, sometimes the river is a bridge. And I had to think a lot about it. And when we talked about it, you showed us this work which is also a component in your work, time. You give time, time. Often pieces have, have titles that are either about the perception or the duration of the perception. So here you become quasi-scientific because you looked at exact mm -hmm. coordinates. Where did you stand? What time of the day? Did I take this exact mm -hmm. glacier of this exact glacier in 1999? Mm -hmm. 20 years later. This is nearly scientific evidence now. Do you want to talk about this project a bit? It's fascinating. It's interesting what you say about time, uh, Klaus. It is, um, 
you know, time, I believe, I believe it's, one can say time is the measure of change. And if I'm not wrong, it's Aristoteles and the, and the, the, um, the, the Italian physicist Carlo Rovelli just made a new book about time, which is built upon the fact that time is not a constant. You know, it's, it's highly relative. When I was young in Iceland, I spent a lot of time hiking and gradually got involved in documenting natural phenomena, which served as a sort of sketching or a sort of resource of inspiration. And, and the, the picture to the left here is a glacier and me sitting in a tiny little one propeller Cessna airplane uh, uh, taking the picture with my, in, in, in 99, uh, with my last pocket money, in fact. And the picture on the right is me trying to find the exact same spot uh, uh, from a, a slightly more secure plane uh, and making the same photo. Uh, it's 20 years later, in other words, and, and it is um, a part of this series on the slide before, which is a series that essentially is, as you, one knows from, uh, you know, glacial scientific uh, uh, kind of books and so on, where you see uh, before and after. So here you have, you know, the, the, all the pictures on the left in the frame is uh, the old one and the picture on the right is the new one. And it is literally stunning to see uh, in some of the glaciers has more or less just vanished. And I was flying with the pilot uh, who was a friend of a friend. And I said to him, we are at the wrong glacier. This is not the glacier. I need to find this one. And I was holding the, uh, uh, the photo up to him of the old one. And he said, you are so silly. <laughs> He's an old pilot who's flown a lot. This is the glacier. So it was interesting that it, it, it just actually was physical. It, yeah. I could feel it on my body, the absence of, of, of mass. Yeah. What for me was very important when we started working together in the early 90s, one of the connections was not only the nearly medical, physiological uh, interest in how we perceive, but also the very, very embedded at the heart of your work, your ecological interest. And this is something that is woven through so all of your work and when i do these studio visits i always ask the artist for a very very early work and it's always surprising what comes out because here we have the eyeball so the sphere and the eyeball is a recurrent motif in your work the eyeball can be the sun can be the earth can be a sphere can be a mirror and then the eyeball of course is a window to the world you look out and the world is reflected so you have, I remember we were at MoMA and you did an experiment with a 400 people full theater and we all had after effects and we had to look for 10 minutes at the exit sign and then we saw the exit sign everywhere. This is a work. I'm sorry, Klaus. <laughs> this is a very early work of yours um, where you were only 15 years old. You were already, yeah. if we go for the next one, this is such a recurrence. You have the color palette, you have the pers multiple perspectives. Uh, and so very, yes, exactly. say a bit about this work, Olafur. Well, I was 15 and uh, clearly I was pondering whether I should uh, give up on art altogether. But, but the touching thing I, I think was, I, I was actually interested in, uh, you know, how do we see? I at the time was doing a lot of, um, yeah, exactly this time, I was also dancing a lot. And uh, I was a street dancer, a so-called break dancer, street dancer. And it's not to be compared with what is so amazing today. But the notion was that I, I, I realized that with my physical presence and, and, you know, with the gaze, oh my God, Klaus, you are, you are a punishment. <laughs> I told you I uh, surprised so, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, 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 but the, 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 the notion was what I learned, as you, you can imagine, being, you know, when you're a teenager, you have so little self-confidence. And, 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 you know, I was also, you know, I, I was a, a sort of, um, I was not very present, I could say. But I realized with the dancing, and it, also breakdance, which has a little bit more frictional, it's not exactly like ballet, which is about almost, losing gravity breakdance is almost like making gravity and the physical conditions explicit so the explicitation of the space that i could generate with my body gave me confidence in in what later i believe became a almost architectural thing and the eye was obviously the idea of the gaze and the the eye with many people the sort of the looking or the gaze or the 
eye of the beholder. And um, and the many, I, you know, I was 15, so maybe I was just, uh, I just ran out of ideas. But I now, of course, I can say, no, no, this was actually about something very important, uh, namely a kind of pluralism, as they, I see interestingly that they have dif different colors. Uh, and the no notion that a gaze or a view is never only one, it is always the one of several uh, trajectories. You cannot have one objective seeing, just like a time is never just one piece of uh, temporality, right? Time and chronology is, in fact, many times at the same time. It's a times meeting up, so to speak. Yeah. When I this is funny, yeah. But when this I first not. met you, that reputation of being a very acclaimed breakdancer definitely preceded you. And so we were all about to meet the artist who was a famous breakdancer. And for me, when I look at this picture, it's all about gravity and balance, of course. And it's also about a certain velocity or slowness. It's all about time. And if we go to the next image, that's not much later. So you were like 23 and you did this paper cube. You want to say about- This is first, <clears throat> first year in art school and uh, I managed to get a foot in a door in a bigger exhibition together with uh, uh, two other friends of mine, uh, uh, one of which stayed, we had a little group, we called it Ventilator, and we thought of ourselves as a bit of fresh air or something like this, being first year students. But, and, and we realized if we would have, to, if we wanted any, should I say, if we want to say anything, it better, be, it better be big, or it better <laughs> be convincing in some way or the other. So, so, uh, so we realized with a little budget of $1,000 maximum that we had, the only thing we could afford was this uh, recycled paper from a recycling factory, where, which we got for free. And the, the grass at the bottom was sort of the new, the not yet used, uh, yeah. you know, the, what has not become paper yet. So, so it was a nice little exercise. It, 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 the, the burden on the floor became an issue and they, the, the fire department lowered the amount of people allowed into the space. So it actually didn't become very popular, but, but, but all in all, it, it was about old news. You know, new, new, new news on the floor, old, new news growing and old news, you know, fading, so to speak. And um, it, it's a slide I never show. I mean, the piece, I guess, uh, it existed only for the show. Yeah. These papers are somewhere else now. It's funny to think, right? That, you know, they are probably, or maybe they are oh, soil. Yeah. Um, yeah. Out of which grass is maybe growing. But thinking about a cube of of recycled paper, of old paper, in, on, and it's a cube, it's a perfect cube, it's a perfect square on the floor of lawn. So very early on you had your vocabulary of the circle, of the square, of the triangle, of very clear geometrical shapes, and very early on you had this language. I remember when we first talked about the show 15 years ago, you said, oh God, there's gonna be fire, and water and earth and like all the elements. And, and so that's very early on. Let's go to the next slide perhaps. This is a slide from 1990, same period of time you were in your early twenties. And first we mm -hmm. see it here. Uh, I think the captions are, are kind of charmingly uh, Op spot. opposite. <laughs> So we have one picture that is in the art academy where you projected a window onto the wall and then you showed that piece at the recent Tate show. It reminds us, of course, at, of that eye with a, with a window in it. Say a bit about this because this is uh, such a recurrent motif in your work that you make ourselves aware of what we are looking at in real time. So the perception mm -hmm. and the cognitive process is part of, of completing the work. The, at the, when I was in art school, it took me a little while, but, but I gradually um, got more and more interested in the dematerialization of art. I, I actually, um, I was very influenced by the book by Lucy Lippert, I think, uh, the, dematerial the dematerialization of the object in art and, and the notion that atmospheric conditions, temperature, light, sort of wind, and I looked then at the, 
at the West Coast, uh, Latin art spaces. I looked at the Hantake, early Hantake work, and, and, and the sort of notion of, of the absence of presence would allow for the presence of the viewer to take a stronger hold in terms of being a producer or being an active, you know, an active component instead of a more classical view could be that the, that the classical object would, would simply allow the, 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 the viewer or the visitor in a museum to be more like a consumer. Of course, this is a bit speculative as such, but, but the point with this work was, as you can imagine, to suggest the sun is actually shining outside and there's a window on the other side. And it was uh, me who uh, cleaned out my studio which was actually not very easy, <laughs> but but and then I had a few windows like that. Then it was a school sort of school exam or exhibition and so on. And and they and they also on the left picture here the 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 spotlight is just standing on a tripod. And as you said, Klaus, um, you know you could say it's not so spectacular, but you could say, wow, there's uh, the light uh, from outside is on the wall. Uh, and then you see, aha, it's a spotlight. Uh, just to somehow use the phrase you you mentioned and um, and the, 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 there is something to it which uh, for me has to do with I mean we look and engage and have a sense of what we are involved in occasionally the quality of that allows us to evaluate or reevaluate or reframe or reconsider the way we're looking at it first time also the Turel space out at PS1 um, can that be? Yeah, I hope it was there in yes, 91, yes, wasn't it? Yeah, since 1986. So I saw that and, and I saw, I remember I saw a Robert Irvin show at, it went, uh, was it at B or was it at Pace? I don't know. But, but yeah. so, you know, in a way, I then came back to school and, and, and then the idea of ephemeral, you know, the idea of, of environment, ephemera, ecology, it had a, a much different uh, uh, should I say, presence in my way of yeah. working. Yeah, yeah. You're referring to this time as a very imprinter, as a very important time in your artistic career. I just going to quickly show this. This is you uh, campaigning for clean energy in 1991. We go to the next slide. So happy we have slides again. What would we do without? This is a this is in a cafe in Copenhagen where you had like posters and the facade was with a logo and you had the outside campaigns and you did this very beautiful in the middle here in the middle of those three pictures you had the spotlight on the on the on the on the floor and of course it reminded me first when i saw it of you as a break dancer but of course it puts the spotlights on the viewer to walk in to complete the work and understand you're part of it. So it's a little bit what you, if you go to the next slide, this is one of my absolute favorite pieces of yours, Olaf, where I have to admit, whenever I see it, last time I saw it at the Tate, this year is actually, um, I, I'm mesmerized by it because it includes oh, so much. Thank you of your work. Say a bit about mm. this. Say oh, thank, thank you. Yeah, uh, well, when I see the image, I think about that I had to play, paint the floor in my art school studio in order to show the piece because when it was not painted, it looked rubbish. Um, <laughs> uh, but, and also, of course, um, it's, it is in its own serendipity also about burning your candle at both ends, um, if that's a saying in English, and and in that way, um, you know, one is one of the candles is of course uh, the imaginary one, uh, the, the sort of burning your own imagination, and the other one is the physical one. Um, this being in '91, I I wonder whether I had come uh, to know the work of uh, Gober, um, maybe or maybe not, but but there was a famous Richter painting, I believe, and yes. there was a very other, there was a drawing by Strindberg of the candle. And, and in that sense, I, I, I noticed the Scandinavian sort of uh, melancholy uh, and, and all of that. So and the mirror is wonderful. It's like, I remember I had the mirror as in my bathroom, as a bathroom mirror for a long time after, because you know, obviously the piece didn't, didn't uh, go anywhere. <laughs> I remember when I first installed works of yours, you had to explain to the security and uh, exhibitions department that you will have water, we will have ice, we will have fire, we will have wind. So let's go to the next. Here comes the water. 
And that's one of the very early pieces you and I worked on. And I remember mm -hmm. when we premiered it, unfortunately, this is, this is a wow. You see this beautiful mist cloud that becomes a rainbow, a moving rainbow, because of the misting, the water particles. And you walk in and you also get wet. Uh, this piece is actually, and that's, I'm really so grateful for the museum here in Los Angeles. Mocha owns this piece. You want to say about this? This, for me, again, is one of your really groundbreaking pieces. Thank you so much, Klaus. And it's, um, the, 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 the exercise for me was to um, explore this dematerialization and the eye. So, so as, as a proposal, I was um, working on creating a bit of a water curtain and for an exhibition in Copenhagen, which to a large extent was actually about the eye and not about the water, uh, the, the, the water and the rainbow. But as, as we know, uh, it takes a bit of light or the sunlight, and then a drop of water and an eye. And that angle has to be about 47 degree or 45 degree. And, and that is the three things needed. If you take the eye away, obviously there's no angle then. And that, and that means that here I had a, also an opportunity to say, well, if there's two or three or five people in the world, in, in, in this room, they'll never see the same rainbow. I mean, this photo is nice and straight on and all of that. But when you walk around, the, the colors move, so to speak, with you. And, and the argument for me was, you know, this notion of plurality we mentioned with the eye, with the many pupils, maybe this notion of, well, we, we, we will never be the same, but we can still share the space. And this notion that, like from sensual perspective to politics, right? Uh, this notion of, of difference as an asset or difference as an opportunity was, I think, started here. And I, I was very interested in, you know, I started getting interesting in, I guess, phenomenology, Merleau-Ponty or, or, or Deleuze at the time or, or Bergson uh, even earlier. And, and, and this notion of, well, there's a, highly intimate presence of a subject, a person in the room. There's also something else, which is not very well described in our history at all, uh, is a collective, like a social system, like a group of people with different trajectories, like everyone comes from somewhere else. This piece was the first time where, where, where I think the, the sort of the, the hospitality of peace also opened up for, for, for uh, should I say, for sharing something, a sharing of, of an exp exhibition, of an of a artwork. Yeah. I remember when we first installed it, um, the water hose we used, somebody else had used to get some gasoline into their car because it was all a bit improvised. <laughs> and so the whole installation smelled like, smelled like gasoline and they thought we did that. <laughs> so that's a side yeah, note. It... You explained to me at the time and I didn't understand, I did not understand this until I visited Iceland because you spent a lot of time with your father in Iceland growing up and you spent a lot of, I remember you showed me once a picture of the two of you in a, on a boat, totally remote out back in Iceland. And many of, many of the motifs that you use, I had to go to Iceland to understand that there are waterfalls in like canyons where the canyon is narrow enough that the water comes up again. The water comes up again in the same canyon and breaks into numerous rainbows. The whole area around it is covered with moss because there is a constant, there's a constant flow of, of, of water. And then if you, if you dig into the moss, at some point you come into ice, permafrost, because it's all a question of well, how much is melting and how much is not melting. And if we go to the next slide, and I really owe this to you, this, this understanding of the different aggregate circumstances of nature in, in our planet. This is a work here that you developed a year after beauty it's a wall completely covered with moss. It's a living, it's a living being in the, in the museum. Yes, it's a, and it is in fact reindeer moss, or the same moss that you have in you know, Siberia through Canada and in Iceland, of course, in between. It is, like with the rainbow, I started getting more and more influenced by the natural phenomena as, as we know them. 
I was in particular also interested in the sort of, uh, should I say, the tactility. I mean, how do we touch the untouchable? How do we make visible the invisible? I mean, if there is a rainbow and I go out, is it there? How do I, th this moss wall, um, at very early I showed it, but right at the same time or shortly after, I was invited to a special booth in an art fair in, in Cologne, I think. And, and I said, oh, art fairs, they are so, uh, now they're so against everything I believe in, uh, except uh, one thing, of course. But but it's essentially, I said, let's just put the moss up because to have this live, living, vibrant, you know, this this uh, just so fertile thing, and 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 somehow to introduce the idea of symbiosis, you know, the notion that 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 um, how should I say, symbiosis like the anti hierarchical, like the the the, um, the non-Darwinistic, like collaborating is better than competing. And the, these sort of notions of ecology with eyes, rainbows, water, so they somehow started, I, I couldn't really articulate it to that extent, but remember this is just around when the Kyoto Protocol was founded. Yeah. And yeah. that was, and you know, uh, there was a number of sort of beginning, should I say, Planet, planetary uh, discussions, um, and I was not uh, was not so involved. There was, uh, but my my relationship with Iceland really inspired me to to somehow own this language, but also my democratic, um, you know, as it is uh, nowadays, uh, the democratic values of Denmark. So, but the welfare society, uh, you know, that also inspired me. So this notion of sh how do we share. How do we make a green wall? And be mindful of there was no green walls in architecture in that year. But that's yeah. super wild. So, it, you know, 10 years later, Patrick Blanc, we did with Hertha de Mont, the first sort of growing wall. And, and, and I, was, I was very interested, maybe architecture needs to be plants. And maybe moss, the living moss is something. But little did I know that that, that that became so mainstream. So when I show it now, people just say, Oh yeah, well we've seen a whole skyscraper in Milano with plants, and I go like, yeah, I know. Yeah, but I think also it's your venturing into architecture because being there at the time, it's a moss wall. A wall is normally what architecture provides you with, and I remember the first time experiencing it, and you encouraging everybody to touch it. And I consider plants beings. You see them right behind me. I live with these beings. I'm very cautious about them. So you, you were encouraging us to touch them. They smell, they have a very strong smell. The moss has a smell, but moss walls, the second is really wall and architecture. And let's go a little bit faster through the next slide, which is another wall, a monochromatic wall. Again, not moss, but here like a, a foil, a film in the space. And if we go to the next piece, that's actually a video, fingers crossed, knock on wood, it's gonna work. It's always interesting in Zoom. Let's see. This is basically like a little propeller engine and it's also like Foucault's pendulum. It's, it's basically, um, by its own weight, a pendulum, and by its own motor propelling itself up, only falling back by its own weight and gravity. And if we go to the next, here we see this old Postfuhramt, and here it's in the atrium of MoMA where it found a permanent home. Say a bit about this piece, because I think this piece is also part of mechanical movement that applies very much these laws of gravity and balance also going forward. Oh, thank you, Klaus. You should mention that you, in fact, curated the show in Passwamp and showed the ventilator first in this. I remember, how we were, <laughs> I remember how we were clueless what to do in that space. And we were so clueless, we had to take a break and we were basically flat on the floor looking up and then you had an aha moment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, that was, uh, that was good. And also, um, and, and, and at, at MoMA, it was, uh, 
I had a version of it shown, a very, very early version shown at, uh, at the LA Gallery at Mark Fox, who had a gallery back then. And the, and the, uh, and the, um, how was it? It was donated to MoMA, uh, which was amazing, uh, by a, a collector, Peter Norton, out of, uh, out of California as well. So, so um, the idea of the weather and the wind, and I mean, clearly the machine is something you might have at home. It's like a $20 ventilator from the hardware store. And, and this notion that, the, that that little very practical thing had such magic in it. And, and as the wind or as the weather on, on our lovely planet has, uh, is so unpredictable, it has that same sort of uh, almost like a, a mad insect. It just flies around in this highly unpredictable way. And there's a lovely element of, uh, I don't call it danger, but that, that the slight sense of, um, of a threat. There is know, danger. When we first installed it, you wanted it. You wanted it so it could just nearly hit the tallest person's head. So we had it very <laughs> low. And then the security came and he said, no, 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 it has to not hit a person raising their hand. So we had to put it a bit higher. Exactly. It's been up and down depending on the show and so on and so forth. You know, people almost people always or museums or instill you know institutions they underestimate how smart their visitors are you know, <laughs> no they when you know they always think oh somebody's gonna go and like hurt themselves on, on purpose also so so it actually has been hanging low occasionally and never never anything happened uh, because as we know once they made their way into the museum they are actually already you know uh, cause uh, you know conscious about um, uh, what's going on and i think I love this notion of that, that the possibility of danger also, or not danger, but the yeah. possibility of something gives the responsibility to the person, you see? So there is a question of authority here, which is also very interesting. Do we trust each other or not? And I see, I see in America, you will always sue each other, zigzagging if, if not. But you know, in, in, it's just important to emphasize the, the, the ability to say to a visitor, to an exhibition, you are actually smart. I actually believe in you. You, 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 you are gonna be fine. And I know I don't need to tell you how to be. And so, so for me, it also has to do with that. But it, it's an amazing uh, uh, work. I've showed it uh, uh, quite a bit. It's that work is now on show in Bilbao in one of Frank Gehry's uh, unbelievably uh, amazing spaces. I felt this piece is always about empowering people for the responsibility they have for themselves and others, because you could also just hit somebody, but it also activates, it makes people activists. And I think that was one of the very first piece with beauty and this, where people started moving, using, participating in a very different way. And if we go, to, we go a little faster through the next slides, because otherwise this is gonna take like five hours. Here's your sun machine where you cut a hole in the ceiling and the sun is like a dial. It's a, like a sun dial. We go to the next. Kaleidoscopes, the way of how you look at a kaleidoscope. One of your pieces of vocabulary is a mirror. We saw this with a beautiful piece on the candle. A kaleidoscope, the mirroring into mirrors, the fractional view. This is something we go to the next slide. Another important motif in your work is a waterfall. And this is a reversed waterfall. Say a bit about mm -hmm. this, because I think I use this waterfall and I only have Versailles as the other waterfall in this presentation. Um, mm -hmm. Say a bit about how yeah. you got to this very unique piece. Yeah, that's at PS1, had a lovely curator uh, showing it there. But um, the, the, um, it's almost like unlearning how to see. It's like, you know, because of our, you, you saw the, um, the slide before with the kaleidoscope, which is sort of a compound seeing. It's, a, it's turning seeing into a spectacle or in a miracle. It's about the ability to see the wonder and defunctionalizing uh, seeing, right? So, so upside down waterfall is of course making, making the impossible possible. As you said, sometimes the river is the bridge. And, mm. and in that sense, the, 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 the sort of, we don't really think about it when, you, the, when the sun shadow travels through the room uh, with a hole in the ceiling, you can actually see it moves. 
And what you see is the speed with which the planet Earth is traveling through space. So it's a little bit like Piero Manzoni's uh, work, Sockle du Monde, which is just a sockle and the planet is underneath it, right? So it's like the sockle for the, for the planet. This notion of making, you know what, what Timothy Morton calls a hyper optic, the things we just don't see or can't get, it's too big. The planet or the sense of gravity and the, the natural forces and the fact that our sense is, is locked into a cultural uh, sort of predefined uh, grid it deprives us for criticality. It's very hard for me to make a fast uh, comment here, like Klaus, I'm sorry. But, you know, so, 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 so this notion of unlearning has also the idea of reintroducing a, se a, a sense of worth, but also a sense of criticality, both to yourself, but also on, upon the world. Yeah, I think what you said about the cut in the ceiling you feel your own movement, you perceive it, but you, you literally see the Earth's movement. So it's very planetary and you feel empowered the viewer to identify their own eyeball with the sun or their own eyeball by their own eyeball with the planet. So if we go like a little faster through the next slides, this is this scandalous, scandalous work Green River, where you show, we, you make visible the, the, how we treat our rivers and you make visible, this is actually here, the LA River. And this is such an eye-opening piece in a way. Let's go for the next piece, another visualizing empty space or visualizing lights. This is a cubic meter of light, which is the wow. It's a minimal shape, like you had the, the garbage, the, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. waste paper, the recycled paper. Let's go for the next one. I think this is another minimal shape here. You have this rectangular shape of an earth wall. Say a bit about mm -hmm. this piece. This is an unknown piece that you showed at Hamburger yeah. Bahnhof. Yeah, it's a it's a out behind the museum, and as as uh, you know, Klaus. But 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 for the rest, of the museum is located very very close to the uh, former uh, border between east and west. And and um, digging down into the soil is almost like a kind of archaeological or excavation of time. And and then the idea of uh, you know the wall in Berlin and 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 the earth, because the earth in or under our feet everywhere has its own agency. The earth is telling stories. The earth has unknown but yet to be found out feelings. So, so the idea I think was to sort of give, um, well, no, I, today I could say, I wouldn't say, it, I did not know how to say it back then, to give the earth the rights of personhood, you see, to give it the valuable uh, space in order to, to sort of tell its story. And the rammed earth uh, uh, technique used uh, that I learned uh, from a friend of mine who in fact helped me doing it uh, was also interesting because this notion of compression and so on and so forth. So it was a, it was a wonderful opportunity and behind the museum I left the hole open. Yeah. Uh, I didn't quite uh, expose the foundation because some other uh, artists did that. But you know, I, there was a big hole behind the museum and people could look out the window and say, why is that? You know, there is a hole in the, 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 the sort of space behind the museum. Yeah, we go to the next piece. It's another not so known piece. It's actually a circular mirror, but the circular mirror is like a lung. So it inhales mm. and exhales. And when it inhales and exhales, it goes from a convex to a concave mirror. So the optical qualities of enlarging showing an image upside down are mutating, are living. It's like a lung and an eye at the same time. Say a bit about it's this. Almost, it's, a, it's a mylar mirror on a, on a box. So exactly like you say, it is as if the mirror is respirating. It is, well, nowadays, obviously everyone knows that this is a ventilator for what we see in the mirror. It's the ventilator of the wall looking back at us. So in the mirror, uh, when visiting uh, uh, the exhibition, you would look and then you would become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Then you become smaller and smaller and smaller, very slowly. Then you became bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's funny because obviously the distance to the wall behind you 
is much bigger than you are. So it looks like the walls behind you is like incredibly uh, uh, changing. So it has a, it's a very, very simple exercise um, uh, uh, that, that all it takes for you to, to question the, the contract you physically have with the world is a mirror to breathe because all the rules are off. So it's again that whole thing of let's show that the rules are not necessarily true. Yeah. They are relative to the time in which we live. They're an incredible piece. So if we go to the next, this is like your, your atlas, your vocabulary. I mentioned very early on you working with architects and you have a whole architectural department uh, in your studio with some shapes you, you, you give homage to Buckminster Fuller, some other shapes you developed. You have a whole vocabulary here. This is looking into your toolbox. This is looking into your vocabulary. We go to the next slide. And this is, of course, your, 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 your public coming out as an ecologically aware artist, so to say, the weather project. Always the title is so important. And I want to show the next slide. Say a bit about this piece that I think might be one of the most uh, recognizable pieces of contemporary art, if you ask people in the broader audience. Say a bit about how you, what's your relationship with this piece? Well, the, the space was of such grandness that one I would argue, or I tried to argue, was able to show the environment or the, the, the negative space rather than show the walls. And maybe I could exercise a more hospitable version of hosting people by being atmospheric or ephemeral. And so, uh, uh, quite literally speaking, with a, a bit of smoke and mirrors, and then a half disc and monochromatic light and a few, few sort of extra things there. I, I had the um, opportunity to, to, to create something that at first was recognized, oh, that's the sun in a space. But as you walk through it, you would be allowed to reclaim your own body, which I felt people saw as something liberating. So, so people very quickly started interacting and playing and, and they also started recognizing each other. And, and that is what I mentioned earlier, this whole notion of I'm having a highly intimate and my own personal experience, but I am also a part of something bigger than myself. And for art, I, uh, to be able, I'm so convinced art is capable of this idea of you know, uniting without era a, a sort of uh, taking away the singularity of an experience. And as you can see then, I, I mean, every day, literally, people did various things. Uh, the bush was, bush was pa passing by, as, as you can see, and, and so on and so forth. But the, the, the issue, I think, which was interesting was what people enjoyed was having or, or holding hands with ephemera. And that might be sort of what, what, what people were um, so caught by, this notion of it is actually not what we see, but how we see and also why we see. Yeah. That I think gave it some, some, uh, somehow, some foundation. For me, because I thought I had read how it was constructed, like the mirror, like a half circle, like the light. And sometimes you think you understand a piece by just seeing an image. And I remember I traveled to London to see it. And I was reminded of two aspects. First is that art is not... Medi art cannot be mediated. You have to be in front and in front of its presence, one on one, and it became a communal experience. I think that was such an important aspect to it that it became really a participatory communal aspect because this is a public space. What you do in a public space, you have a public experience. But then the other thing I felt was so important, a, a sunset, that very specific light of a sunset is a very fleeting moment. You wait, you wait, you wait, and if you come too late, it's over. It's just this moment, very, very short moments that this light is there. But here, it was like you had put reality on pause. This fleeting moment of the sunset where this beautiful light is there wasn't fleeting. It was, so you always thought about, am I fast or slow? Um, and 
of course, it had something apocalyptic in it but, and something incredibly beautiful. Is, are all museums around the world asking you to redo this? Have you ever considered that? Occasionally, yes, and, um, and, and they're very humble and I'm very honored to be asked. So um, it's, not, it's not that I would never do it, but it's a thing that is not easily doable because there was no, there was no Instagram, there was no social media, there was no, it was not, not so long time ago, it's hard to believe, right, 2003, there was only a press release and the press. Imagine how, how they just sat on the meat back then. But so, so it's, 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 it was a very special um, opportunity. And, and um, obviously, as time has gone on, it has also taken on different meanings. Yeah. And it's lovely to see that there is not one explanation that is right. And you're right. Some said it's, oh, this is apocalypse. Uh, you know, it's the, the end of something. And other people said, oh, it's a... This is like a Japanese guy, and I need to be contemplative and do a Buddhism yoga. And then the next moment they said, Wow, so do you see so different? Let's marry. And then they got married in the in the church, actually, and um, and the priest came and, and so on and so forth. And I'm not kidding, there was there was this idea, and Merce Cunningham, Merce Cunningham did one of his great lay last performances with his dance team in this in the show. It was a spectacular collective uh, and, and somehow unifying uh, a moment. We have another 50 slides, so I'm going through a little faster. And you stop. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going too fast. I'll, I'll, see, then I thought I might as well do it, right? And, 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 and um, yeah, Photoshop. Right? Yeah, Photoshop. That's, so, my own, that's, that's my own eye. Amazing. So we go to the next slide. And Go to the next here. You're harvesting ice in Iceland and you are not that fast. Perhaps we'd go one back. So you harvested the ice, melting glacier ice, and you brought it into the gallery. So the gallery is cooled down. And so this was a sculptural experience that you had with the, light, uh, with the ice. It's also very much a one-on-one -on -one with these objects of ice, these fragile objects. And then you showed this in different urban settings. So we go here to so the next you have in Paris. And perhaps we go during, during the COP15 in Paris. Yeah. This is one of the pieces where your work, you realize a level of activism and public outreach, which is often unrivaled in these projects. Say a bit about the reaction of these pieces, Olaf, if, if, if you like to. Well, <clears throat> it was, um, so it is actually glacial ice that, as you said, in this case, we picked it up in Greenland, collaborating with the amazing geologist and glaciologist, Mini Gorsen from Denmark. The, the thing is that it's about 10 to 20,000 years old. And this took place during the COP and um, it was reported by Bloomberg and his uh, initiatives on environmental things. And the COPs are, of course, what the UN uses to have the climate meetings. And so was the one in Paris, was actually initiated by the UN, uh, for whom I occasionally uh, work a bit. So, so the eyes, it is of such uh, nature that it has this cracking sound because the small bubbles of air from 20,000 years ago are caught in the pressure of the ice, as we know it. And this is how we can tell what the air was a, a like a long time ago, right? And, and when you stand close to it, you can hear this popping sound, like pop, 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 pop. It's almost like, like, like a kind of music, and you realize how it is melting, and yeah. you can almost smell something. So, so it's a very sensory sort of uh, uh, thing. And uh, just people standing, looking at it, they say, oh, this is ice, and you know, they, they understand the story, of course, the environment and so on, but then they put their hand on it. And then they say, oh, it's cold. And do you see how, how so, so, so it is as if knowing about ice and touching ice, that's two different parts of the brain. So in terms of uh, the great work that the UN is supporting by Elke Weber, the behavioral psychologist, what is a change agent really? And, and I, and, and so I won't go too granularly. So it's also very much about well, if I'm going to have a relationship with the climate or with the environment, I need to be able to have some physical 
memory of it. I need to somehow not just read about it in a book. So these are the sort of uh, discussions um, um, that we have uh, done. The studio in Berlin was was uh, incredible in in uh, getting you know so to get the ice from Greenland and also counting the environmental footprint of doing it and hanging a poster next to it saying this is how much carbon has been used to this the same amount that two school classes from London to Greenland um, and and you know so it's also about yeah. how do we talk how do we how are we transparent how are we just uh, to the people we are uh, with. And how do we neutralize the carbon footprint? Absolutely. I go through the next slides. So this is a piece that I always reminded me when I first, when you first told me about it, of your break dancing, but it's actually you walking through a park in slow motion, which I think is such an important piece. And perhaps we go to the next. This is Aarhus in Denmark, where you, one sees that on the right, there's a small picture of this incredibly corona that this museum has, which is a gradual color scheme, like a rainbow. You go to the next. Who hasn't seen this in real? I'm just venturing in your architectural uh, practice. Here's a beautiful design for the Opera House in Reykjavik. We go to the next. Your sound gallery, which was one of the incredible highlights of your really absolutely stunning show in Beijing. Perhaps we go to the next. And you have been very active in Ethiopia. You are supporting certain non-for-profits there and you rarely talk about this. Do you wanna talk about this a little bit if, if that's within your comfort mm -hmm. zone and then talk- Oh, about absolutely. Yes, uh, Klaus, thank you so much. And, uh, and thank you for sharing the other pictures. My God, I should just come to your lecture about my work. That's, that's uh, much nicer than, than listening to me. I won't say so, anything. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's, uh, so yes, I have, um, I have a relationship with Ethiopia or East Africa. I, I actually teach at the uh, art academy there and, and so on and so forth. And um, uh, one of the things that I uh, was interested in was the, the environment and of course the exit, access to sustainable energy and for some years now um, it so happened I got a grant and it, it and I met a solar engineer and that's a long story but we ended up doing a little solar lantern and I can I can just quickly do a sunrise can you put me in the picture is that an option with you can we am yeah. I, oh, uh, am I other people? is it possible to just see Olaf on the screen hold on I can I guess if I talk I might just wait no, no, you don't have to go out, Klaus. It's it's fine, but I I only see Klaus. But let me just try it because in case it's different for you. Oh, here we go. So uh, let me just show you um, because I harvested the sun in Copenhagen today, and it looks like a sunrise in Copenhagen looks like this. It goes up in this side, and then it goes through through. Oh, I'm sorry. It's it's on this side, of course. Yeah, from east to west. <laughs> Otherwise the the, the earth would spin the wrong way around. But so, so all in all, it's a solar panel and it's a little LED and it is an attempt to make sustainable energy affordable where kerosene and diesel and so on is used to create energy locally. And the idea is to compete simply on market conditions with what is the price of oil. Uh, needless to say, it's easy to think and do, but we have in the meantime delivered more than a million lanterns We've been supported by a number of philanthropic organizations, uh, uh, especially and long term by uh, Bloomberg, but also just only recently by the Earth Alliances and uh, Lorraine Jobs. So, so we feel confident about the work we are doing, which also has other uh, projects and so on. And we have in the meantime expanded across the continent, the great continent of Africa, with either very NGO or very private sector type of projects. Uh, I am actually not so involved, except when I am having a great croissant with Mimi Haas, who is here, uh, who has very generously supported this, um, uh, as well as other people uh, over time, I should say. So, in a sense that that there is a, there is this also the, the, the sort of how should I say crowd sourcing, to to which you know imagine if a hundred thousand people do not buy petroleum. Now take a million people, 
that's a lot of petroleum if they don't buy it in a day. That's a lot of money that can be spent on something else. So, so we talk about solar energy, but the truth is, it's about system design. And yeah. the decentralization of, of such decisions in countries where there is a, let's say, a strong track record for a highly set or like a completely centralized, uh, sort of totalitarian almost uh, government, right? So, so, so it, it is a, it's a very interesting and quite emotional project for me because it is as with my other work, it's about touching the untouchable, right? So seeing the invisible. And that is, uh, so thanks for bringing that up, Klaus. I, I, I don't mention it because it's not about me. I am not doing it. You know, I was lucky to design it and I, so I, I own it, which I sometimes wish I didn't, be, uh, considering how we're working. But all in all, uh, it, it's an amazing project. Yeah. So perhaps the next slide we should have a look. This is an incredible work you just did right now on uh, <laughs> in, in the virtual. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so in Corona here, sitting then on lockdown and so on, obviously there's like, all my shows are closed. Uh, um, and I thought, okay, there's one space still open. And my friends in London at Acute Art, who is yeah. a, a, an artist, uh, digital art uh, uh, provider, they, they have produced uh, a kind of a work, a wunderkammer of many small magic, uh, or relatively magic objects, such as the sun. I'm holding it here in my hand. So it's, it is what is called augmented reality. Uh, I have studied it for quite a while. So, so I, I follow, even though I am a very analog artist, I follow with great interest the, the sort of the, the, the sort of the socializing potential of the digital space. And you can see me in the back, right there at the mirror in the very back, actually. You can see I'm not holding us on in the mirror, uh, strangely enough. But so with these augmentations and, 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 you know, being on a Zoom call, this is very close to a kind of a Zoom opportunity. And I have all these other rainbow waterfalls, like everything we talk about almost, you can find in my little Wunderkammer in the digital augmented uh, space. Yeah, if we go to the next slide, this was a very, very important moment because I think what you do with Little Sun, you are empowering because when we first talked about Little Sun, you talked about how many people live without electricity or access to electricity, about the ability to read in the evening. And then Little Sun became Often, I remember after Hurricane Sandy, after Hurricane Maria, it became a tool after natural disasters. And say a bit about this incredible performance you orchestrated at Carnegie Hall. Yeah. yeah so, so Jesse Smith and Patty Smith, her mother, uh, were doing a concert with lots of uh, Michael Stein and lots of amazing uh, people. And, uh, and uh, I got invited. Uh, probably uh, in the absence of someone else uh, and and i said okay i will just fill it up with little sons and uh, let's put the stage in the room let's not do anything on the stage so i stood on the stage and instructed everyone to do sort of a uh, like a kind of a hand dance um, I, um what's her name um ah oh, this i need to remember the mind as a muscle but the notion of you know d d saying the periphery the room not the states. The periphery is important, right? And and the uh, and the notion of, of of a field of grass or seeds, you know, the sort of the prairie grasses. So one of the many few things we did was prairie grass, <laughs> like like you know waving, and and then we filmed it and made a little bit for social media for this amazing organization called Pathway to Paris, who's doing something again very soon. Um, and there is three hundred and fifty dot org. Uh, they are there's so many great organizations in this. It's really something worth to support. And I've been lucky to be in the company of these amazing musicians and stage performers. Uh, I, with, know that this with was little, not, I know that you were not a filler in this. I know that they, the organizers <laughs> were very, very, very excited and nervous and anxious to get this incredible performance. And all of these works, the little sons were then sent to Puerto Rico after the hurricane. I want to show two more pieces. One is the incredible waterfall you did in Versailles. And perhaps we see if we can pull that up on the slideshow. Because I think your works have, have reached a level of recognition and a level of, um, 
they're, they're grand as they are revealing. They are making aware. And I think when you first started, um, you said, oh, perhaps people didn't take that for so serious. But I think what you did with the little son with Ethiopia, what you do with the little son now as, a, uh, as, an, as an action item that you, you sent to areas that are struck by the climate crisis. I think this is so important. And you create these images. Say a little bit about Versailles, if, if we can. Well, of course, uh, for, uh, for a um, person obsessed with democracy like myself, the Versailles is really interesting, and the French Revolution and, and all of this, without being too, too detailed. The garden is an engineering uh, feat uh, by Louis XIV, who had then uh, the vision to create a garden that would uh, create a sort of a, a, a illusion perspective, uh, perspective where the garden seems a lot bigger and longer than it is. Uh, as you, you can almost see it on the photo, it's as if something is tilting, even though it's flat. Mm -hmm. And it, so it's a classic uh, garden perspective, um, you know, French, uh, in, even though it's Italian in, in real, but the French uh, made it bigger as usual. They, they, and, and, and what a waterfall does, I mean, first of all, it's a natural phenomenon, and water falling is just always touching, right? But what it does, it introduces something that would eliminate the patriarchy of the perspective, namely temporality in the sense that it showed the, the dimensions, right? When we look at water falling, we see how far away it is. You know that you see a waterfall going really slow or, or a waterfall going very fast, but one is far away, and one is close by. See, so, so, so time, and this is of course, again, something you can go and practice in Iceland if you, if you wanna be in a space with no sense of scale and lots of waterfalls, because you just wonder, should I hike this maybe in two days or in two hours? So the waterfalls, they, they, they bring back scale to the human. It's like a rehumanizing dimension. And, and if anything is out of human dimension, it is of course Versailles and the whole idea of, uh, uh, you know, being a god and, and all of that. Uh, so, so, so neatly, uh, as I was very excited about uh, putting it there, it was a bit too ambitious maybe, but uh, it ended up looking amazing um, with, with the water just very slowly falling. It's a construction crane. It's incredibly tall. Uh, so it was not easy, uh, but then again, uh, so the, the rest of the Versailles was not easy at the time. So it, it always- we're going, we're going from monumental to domestic. If we go to the next slide. Oh, that's not the domestic yet. This is the Red Brick Museum, an incredible installation where you had a mirrored ceiling and a half circle. Perhaps we go to the next. Oh, yeah. Say, about, say a bit about this, because I put this at the end of the slide presentation, because it's when we looked at your first, you were 15, you had the photos, you had the drawings of the eye with, with yeah. with multiple eyeballs, with multiple irises, you, the circular spheres, uh, the chromatic experience of mixing colors, but also the very accessible way of how you make people aware what they're actually seeing and how they're seeing it and the seeing process as a timed cognitive process. Yeah, I'm basically repeating myself, that's clear. Um, I, I'm, doing the same, I'm doing the same all the time, but, but it actually, uh, I have worked a lot with watercolors. I'm very interested in, 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 the, in the, you know, I call watercolors the Formula One or the Formula Zero, I guess you call it nowadays, or Formula E, right? Of, so oil painting is below, and so the watercolor for me is the, you know, to be good at watercolor, that's amazing. I really think that's something. Yeah. So, so glass has that ephemeral, quality because glass essentially is liquid if you sit and, and wait long enough. Like, uh, and, and this notion of having a plane where you, by removal of something, create something to look at. So it's not like, it was not like um, I was trying to create the absent of the object as the narrative. I also had a work called The Absence of Presence, but it's still something, but it's still something you can see. And it was something that Klee did in some of his watercolors. You know, he, he painted everything, everything but what he wanted to say. 
and and I like this notion of we probably sometimes needs to we we need as you said earlier sometimes the river is the bridge sometimes it's by removal excavation it's about liberation it's about taking away that we have also that we can create a narrative and and these glassworks uh, actually are made of glass some of them uh, are depending and back and forth by minerals that i have picked up in and and only recently i started sort of using glacial dust or minerals from the earth in iceland so so uh, as we know glass is made out of silic silicate and which is sand essentially but then you add you know some some uh, other mural like iron if you want red and uh, no um, uh, well let me not go there and and so i've been working making these mirror plates myself that's incredible and you have a whole department that i we could visit where you do studies on watercolors and coloring and color graduation so perhaps we we end the, the, our talk with the with the first slide which was these incredible glaciers if you were if because you're also working as a teacher if you were sharing with a larger audience if you were sharing with other artists how do you see art in in responsibly and actively how do you see art being a force for change and a force for good in in this uh, looming climate crisis how in this happening climate crisis because let's see what you visualize here the glacier series 20 years later what do you how do you see art having a role in in fighting this all of war? well i think the world or let's call it our garden we need to cultivate our garden right if we look down we are all standing on our garden this is a, i believe voltaire the world is our garden and we need to cultivate it. So, so art, I think, is a response to a dialogue. Art is not a sort of isolated or solipsistic. I mean, it can be, and that is okay. But art is also putting out a statement and participating in a discourse. Sometimes the discourse, uh, you know, there's, art is like um, a language. It is not the language that is interesting. It is what you say with it. So there is many types of art, and some art will probably choose to have a, a, a role in the discourse around the shape of our planet or the well-being of our planet. And I welcome that. Uh, some people say it might be an uh, element of functionalization. Then, you know, all the things that the avant-garde fought for to liberate art from every, any agendas. But I disagree. I actually think that the liberation of art in the avant-garde was an agenda as well, right? It's not that, that, it's not that there's certainly no no hooks into the planet or there's no reality around the art. So I'm actually confident that art, culture as such, art, theater, literature, music, everything, you know, Jonathan, everything is in fact a part of the, the, the global discourse. And, and um, I, it, it, it's very important not to become patronizing or moralizing, but we also have to take it upon ourselves that culture or art we always claim the moral high ground. I mean, it's like, it's like almost nothing more uh, uh, sort of egoistic than an artist who talks a lot. Not that I know any, but you know, the, the notion, how do we own this ground? How do we walk the talk? Or is it the other way around, right? So, so, so there's something incredibly important, which is why what you're working on, Klaus, is so important to be able to make a work of art which is in its values and its governance in synchronicity with the values and execution of our institution, right? So, so we cannot claim this moral high ground if we are not in a system that subscribes to the, self, the same values. So for me, it's not a question of can art, can art participate? It's more a question, do we unite at the cultural sector being such a big part of civic society? We have a huge responsibility to be a civic co-producer, but we need to make sure that what the way we do it is not, you know, undermining what we are saying. So, so and, that, and that is why I, I, I think your work or the work in, at the LA MOCA is so uh, fundamental to, to, you know, to the future of, of these questions. Uh, because there are, as we know, art by itself is not necessarily need, it doesn't mean that it's very convincing. Wow, that's a, a uh, 
It's a very strong uh, art by itself. It's not very convincing. When I look at your work, that's of course only the humble and modesty coming from an artist. Uh, I do think that you create images that make us aware and that are images that don't age. We had recently a discussion amongst colleagues where we looked at certain eras of history and how do you visualize them? You visualize them with images that were created. And I think between the Glacier series, between the Little Sun as an activist tool, between the spheres, between the weather project, um, what are you working on right now, Olaf? Or is there, is there, uh, because you say, um, yeah, maybe I am, um, maybe I am, um, yeah, I would love to say something which has not been announced. So you have to keep it uh, among yourself. And, and maybe I should rephrase, art is not amazing by itself. That is of course not true. But what I meant was that it is in the interlocking, the connectedness, the time, the planet, the people, the, it is there that I think, or for me personally, art uh, flourishes. If an artwork is alone on the moon, well, let's just say I'm less interested, except I, yeah, maybe that is actually interesting. So let's just stop here. But, but as I'm working on, um, well, I am uh, fortunate to uh, be working for EU. I'm a big supporter of uh, multilateralism. I believe in, you know, I'm a big supporter of EU. And uh, I'm very much against uh, sort of, a, should I say, the obsessive border uh, system that the corona has uh, also uh, reinforced. And it is a, it's actually a digital work of art for children and young people to express their views on the planetary needs. So I think we have a global discussion, but the children and young people, like Greta, uh, inspiringly has uh, taught us Fridays for Future. I'm very interested in what is this missing voice? Why are we not listening to them? Because obviously they know what they are talking about and they have to be, along, they have to be around you know, for the amount of time uh, 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 that we have been around. You know, so it's interesting that everyone deciding the well-being of the planet have as little time left as the children has lived. So the app, uh, it is an app uh, for phones. Uh, it is essentially a messaging system where you can take nature and give it a voice and send it off. I haven't talked about it at all. So, so he, I got a, a bit of chunk of money and lucky it was, uh, lucky it was uh, a digital artwork because I worked on it for two years already, almost. And, and that is a big thing for me this uh, in 1st of July, you know, to, to give voice to the planet and to the children. Oh, that's incredible. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing this with us. What a, yeah, what don't tell what anyone. An amazing visit. What an amazing visit. So we're now bringing everybody back. This was a fake ending for the video. <laughs> Thank you. That was incredible, Olafur. Thank you so much. This is really. Oh, thanks.